Hello there, I'm Black Right. So much stuff going on um, in the media, in the news, um, pop being passed around. Um, yeah, so I'm just sharing what I'm receiving as and when I'm receiving it. Um, if it's the first time you're visiting my channel, then welcome, share, like, press the thumbs up, whatever you like to do. Um, for my existing subscribers, I just want to thank you for your loyalty, for your comments. I just want to thank you. Um, yeah, so what did I want to talk about today? I wanted to talk about England closing its doors on Africans. And um, it, we're talking about Africans because it's a specific case. There's actually been some studies done to show that the systems that they're using in the Home Office discriminate against Africans. So um, I'm going to read what I found and um, I'll leave it up to you. Okay, British MPs have warned that the UK visitor visa system is broken and doing severe damage to UK-Africa relations. The problems faced by experts trying to visit the UK are so widespread that many Africans believe the Home Office to be prejudiced against them and deliberately trying to reduce visitor numbers. After six months taking evidence from people working across a range of sectors, cross-party parliamentary groups for Africa, Malawi and the Diaspora developed development and migration report that UK visitor visas are inaccessible to many Africans, under-resourced, unaccountable and widely perceived as biased or even discriminating against African. The thing is, is that with these systems, they have a thing that every, well, they just think that everybody who is black is, is suspect. And they, they, there's these stereotypes that people from Africa are, um, are doing something fraudulent. They're not who they say they are. And the thing is, is that they've got these algorithms in, in the system that's the picking out um, people coming from different countries, but it's not discerning whether or not the calibre of the person. And it's very insulting when you get top quality people who are rich, who are wealthy, who are coming over for conferences, are being stopped and their um, accolades are being questioned. Labour MP Chi Onrua, chair of All Party Group for Africa, said, at a time when UK needs to be open for business, the broken visa system is doing severe damage to UK-Africa relations across a variety of sectors. It is embarrassing, patronising and insulting for African applicants and leaves the slogan of global Britain empty and meaningless. You see, if, if Britain doesn't want to work with, a globe, with, with the world, they shouldn't call themselves global Britain. If they're not open for business with Africa, they should say so. But they shouldn't make it look as though they're open for business for the whole world and then have systems in place to discriminate against certain races and certain um, countries. That's not right. Just be open with your intentions. Everybody understands that you're trying to cut net, net migration. Everybody understands that you're trying to stop illegal immigration. Everybody understands that. But if you're putting systems in place that are discriminating and you've got no factors behind it, no proof, no evidence to say that these people that are coming in are, are questionable, then what are you doing? You might as well just put a blanket statement and say, OK, we're a global Britain except for Africans or except from people from the Caribbean. Or why not just say we're a global Britain, but, we, but not for blacks? Any other country we're global for, but not for blacks. We don't want blacks here. So black people know where they stand. The ones that are coming in who have been invited in to speak at conferences or to do research, they won't waste their time. They won't waste their money on applications. If they know up front that you're just not interested in black people coming to your country. You've, got, you've had enough of them. There's enough of them here. You don't even want the ones that are here. You don't want them here. So just be up front with it. Home office, just tell the people, look, we don't want you. So that's why we're putting these algorithms in our systems to stop you from coming in. 
and nobody wastes their time. The only reason why these people are coming in is not because they want to be here. It's because they've been invited to speak. They're specialists and they've been invited to speak on various topics. That is specific to whether where it's they're coming from or specific to the research that they've done. Anyway, a definition of global Britain. Sorry, a definition of global Britain since Brexit vote, the UK government has championed the notion of global Britain as a vision for the country's future outside the EU. For the government, it appears to mean a Britain trading freely across the world, as in the days of the empire. Britain trading freely across the world. Well, maybe it's on their, maybe it's on their, um, on their rules. Maybe they want to go trading, but they don't want anybody to come here. Maybe that's what it is. Global Britain is meant to be about in reinvesting in our relationships, championing the rules-based international order and demonstrating that the UK is open, outward-looking and confident on the world stage. What a load of bull. But how can it do that if it blocks the international black rich at every opportunity? Many of those who gave evidence felt UK VI systems in Africa look to place barriers and impediments in the way of applicants in order to deliberately decrease the number of applications received as more and more people are put off visiting the UK. In one case, senior producers at the London International Festival of Theatre told the committee that they were unable to bring a dancer from the Congo to perform his personal experience of the Civil War. The reason given for refusal was that they had not done enough to recruit dancers from the UK for the role. So what the UK is saying is that you don't need to bring a Congo dancer, a dancer in Congo. There's plenty of people in the UK who can perform that role for you. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if it's not. One problem faced by a visa applicant was being required to travel hundreds of miles simply for, to apply for a visa. Another was financial discrimination such as people being rejected because they don't have enough money in their bank accounts. This was given as a refusal reason, even where all expenses were being paid by the British sponsors. And the thing is, is that apparently there's only two um, places where they can get a visa, which is in South Africa and London. So where they have to apply for a visa, they literally have to come to this country or go to South Africa to apply for the visa. They can't do it online. They have to do it in person. And then they do that, pay all that money for the flights, pay all that money for the visa, and then it gets rejected. That's what I said. It's a big setup. It's, it's fraudulent. It's, it's, it's stealing. That's what it is. Call a, call a spade a spade. It's stealing. You're deliberately taking money from, from people, from foreign nationals, with no intention of giving them their um, visa. The lack of an appeal system was also cited as a major problem, meaning that the only way to challenge a refusal is to begin with a costly new application. There are dedicated centres for visa applications which have been made, which have to be made in person, and the consideration of requests since two. Th and, and the consideration of quests. So even when they're considering requests, they've got to do it in person. Since 2007, when this system was put in place, the UK government has closed visa sections in high commissions and embassies. Because before, you could just go to your local embassy or your, or your local office, uh, high commission, and you could apply for your visa. Oh, they stopped that now. Talk about placing obstacles. So I'm saying, you know, wherever you are, mate, you might as well stay there. In Africa, stay there. Especially when you're well off. Don't put yourself through this degrading process. It's nice to add it to your portfolio that you spoke at a conference in the UK. It's lovely for your portfolio, but is it worth it? Because a lot of people, that's why they come over here, to add it to their portfolio to say, look, I was a lead speaker at you know at one of the large universities in the UK and that can go as one of their credentials 
but it's not worth the degradation and the humiliation. It really isn't. Plus, you're spending all that money. Information. And the thing is, sometimes it's the British sponsors that are paying that money. And now they're saying that they're not even going to um, hold their conferences in the UK. So UK is losing out. Information obtained during the cross-party investigation showed there are now only two major decision-making decision centres for the whole of Africa, one in Pretoria and one in Croydon. The report argued that this means decisions are taken thousands of miles away from the place of application and far away from local expertise, context and insight that could previously be provided by local embassies. Last month, The Guardian spoke to several African researchers about the arbitrary reasons they received for failed UK visas applications. As well as being rejected for having too little money, some applicants were told they had too much money or were rejected for not having children because this made them likely to fail to return home. So what they're saying is if you haven't got any kids in Africa, you, you want, you're going to want to stay here. I mean... I'm just like, why do they think everybody wants to come here? Why can't they look and be able to discern an application as somebody of that calibre who has that kind of money is only coming for a conference? Why do they think that everybody who's coming into the country wants to stay here, wants to jump on the bandwagon? It's erroneous thinking. Not everybody does. The people who want to be here are those people on the bloody boats who are trying to, and the people on the lorries. You're not going to find anybody now leaving their country trying to sneak in and stay over. They know the risks. So when you see a legitimate application from an established African, you don't reject it. Have some common sense. But the thing is, it's not being done by people. It's been done by equipment. It's been done by algorithms. So the algorithms are not even going to be able to discern who's who. So England is really placing itself in a precarious situation. It's losing its credibility. Ah, oh dear. Anyway. Let me see. In April, a team of six Ebola researchers from Sierra, Sierra Leone were unable to attend training in the UK, which was funded by the Wellcome Trust as a part of a 1.5 million flagship, that's 1.5 million pounds, flagship pandemic preparedness programme. The same month, only one of 25 researchers scheduled to participate in the workshop at the London School of Economics at the Africa Summit was present. A major concern by many who gave evidence for the report was that apparently hostile and disbelieving nature of many refusals. One highly experienced Ebola researcher refused a UK visa was told on the balance of probability we don't believe your researcher. I mean the audacity. The chair of and the arrogance the chair of the UN's Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, which is UNESCO, the UN's cultural body, recently warned that major conferences will be in future be held outside the UK because of visa difficulties. Maybe that's what England wants. Maybe that's what they want. Maybe they don't want um, them coming over here and having conferences. If that's the case. Tell people we don't want you coming here and having conferences. But don't put on a show that everybody's welcome, make it look like people are welcome, and then place obstacles that prevent them from coming in. That's not right. Just be up front. The LSC and University of Sussex are already holding conferences outside the UK to avoid visa delays and refusals, even when the conferences are funded by the British government. The MPs also said refusal letters should be more carefully scrutinised before being sent out to avoid prejudiced or biased assumptions. You see what I mean? They want to word it in a way that, you know, doesn't make it look as though it's prejudice. 
they want to tell them that they don't want them, but they don't want it to look like it's prejudiced. I mean, what a load of bloody bull. You know, they should they should really learn from Trump. Because Trump tells you like it is. He tells it like it is. This English, um, posh, polite, all of that crap, it's not working. And it's not working in your favour. Onwura said, it needs to be recognised that no single issue does more damage to the image or influence of the UK in Africa than this visa question. The thing is, is that, do they really care? I mean, there's so much going on. I mean, I think I think England should learn a little bit, take a bit out of America's book. Just tell people the truth. Just tell them, look, I know, you know, I know you want to come over here from conferences, but at the moment, we're not in a position to accept any applications because we are trying to work on the immigration, the, the over the, you know, the oversupply of immigration, however they want to word it. But we've got too much illegal immigrants in the country. We're trying to focus and spend our resources on trying to sort that out. So we cannot accommodate any more foreign nationals for the time being. But you know why they don't want to do that? Because they want to benefit from their money. They want them to pay. But they don't want them to give what they're paying for. No, that is fraud. That is fraud and theft. So, I, I, in my opinion, they should be honest and just tell them, do without the money, do without all the application fees, do without the conference fees, do without all of that. But don't take advantage. You can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it anymore. You can't do that. It's not going to work. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.